it's that time of year again. Time for our annual seven week fall series. This is the first Sunday and this year we're going to be working with uh, this book up here called Falling Upward, A Spirituality for the Two Halves of Life by Richard Rohr. Uh, the author is a Catholic priest. He's a member of the Franciscan order and he's become a highly regarded author, ecumenical teacher, and a proponent of something that he calls, now get this, he calls it alternative orthodoxy. <laughs> that is a beautiful euphemism, all right? Because he doesn't want to come right out and say that he's preaching heresy. <laughs> but that's exactly what alternative orthodoxy means. Heresy, right? Orthodoxy is the official line, the official teaching. There isn't supposed to be an alternative. Alternatives are heresy. So, there he is. We have his picture up here again. There he is, the happy heretic. The happy heretic. My kind of guy, really. And, and, and so far, he's gotten away with it. Uh, he runs an organization called the Center for action and contemplation. It's in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and so far the Vatican hasn't tried to shut him down or shut it down. Um, the, the Center for, for Action and Contemplation has this very compelling mission statement. Here it is. Amidst a time of planetary change and disruption, we envision a recovery of our deep connection to each other and our world led by Christian and other spiritual movements that are freeing leaders and communities to overcome dehumanizing systems of oppression and cooperate in the transforming work of love. No, no Catholic or Christian jargon in there at all. Um, and, and this is a book that invites us to get union as in Carl Jung, right? The, the psychiatrist and the, the psychoanalysis, the guy who founded analytical psychology. Jung was the guy who came up with all of these ideas that have, that have seeped into our popular culture. Things like uh, the collective unconscious, you may have heard of that. Synchronicity, that was from Jung. Um, and also archetypes, especially archetypes. Acor according to Jung, an archetype is, a, is an innate universal pattern of ideas that cut across geography and culture and help to explain certain aspects of human behavior. Archetypes were created because people from the very beginning have been trying to explain and figure out human behavior and they told stories about it. So you find these archetypes in mythology and stories, you find the patterns in the, the form of the characters and the events and the, the things that are in our ancient uh, and even modern mythology, for that matter. Uh, you might have heard of Joseph Campbell. Now, he was a professor of literature, wrote a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And this is the book where he shows how this, this archetype of the hero shows up in our ancient mythology and, of course, gets carried forward from there. Um, George Lucas, the guy who created the Star Wars series, relied on Campbell's work for the, the structure of the stories, right? So, so Luke Skywalker was an archetypal hero. Darth Vader was an archetypal anti-hero or villain. Um, in fact, here's a quote from an interview that Lucas gave in 2002. He said, It was very eerie because in reading The Hero with a Thousand Faces, I began to realize that my first draft of Star Wars was following classic motifs. So, I modified my next draft according to what I'd been learning about classical motifs and made it a little bit more consistent. I went on to read The Masks of God, that's another Campbell book, and many other books. So, Archetypes, The Hero's Journey, are a big part of the book Falling Upward, and, and Richard Rohr also uses another Jungian concept that's called the two halves of life. Jung is quoted as saying this, he said, the first half of life is devoted to forming a healthy ego. The second half is going inward and letting go of it. <laughs> 
right? <laughs> We're going to be running into paradoxes like this. A healthy ego is a fine thing, and yet it's not enough. Another way of saying it, and this is the way he puts it in the book, he says, the first half of life is devoted to building a strong and healthy container, one that's usually based on establishing an identity that's generally based on things like career, achievement, that kind of thing. Um, we establish boundaries, and we define what we think of as the self. And sometimes we do this, we do this negatively in the sense that we try to distinguish ourselves from what we are not. So we focus on things like gender, ethnicity, nationality, political party, our job, how we dress, that sort of thing. It's not particularly deep, but it's something that we all go through. Um, and you can see it very well in adolescence, right? It's part of the process, it's part of the journey, and it only becomes a problem if we get stuck there. The author says that, that it, it's, it's a great place to begin the journey. It, it's basically all that we have at that point. It's a great place to begin the journey, but it's not a great place to continue the journey. And the other thing he points out is that this is not a chronological thing. When he was working at a children's hospital as a chaplain, he encountered 10-year-olds who were way beyond that kind of first half of life identity. And I'm sure we've all met folks who are well into their 60s and beyond who are still clinging to a, a very adolescent style of identity. It's, it's not a chronological thing. It's about, guess what? Consciousness, right? And it presents us with yet another paradox because if we, if we do it right, if we succeed in building a really good, healthy container during the first half, we eventually find out we don't need it. But before we get to that point, there is often, and I would say always, some kind of falling apart. Different aspects of that carefully constructed container will change, disappear, self-destruct, or come under assault, be damaged by, by outside circumstances that are simply beyond our control. And when that eventually happens, and it always does, it brings about something that Jung called necessary, or maybe we should say unavoidable suffering. The old container will not prove to be adequate to the task, and if we insist on clinging to it, and defending it and trying to avoid that suffering, we will simply multiply the degree of discomfort caused by this necessary suffering. Like I said before, there are children who get this, and sadly adults who maybe never will. And I think that's a big part of the reason why he wrote this book. He's hoping to reach those who haven't realized this yet, and to help those of us who have an understanding to continue the journey maybe with greater clarity, focus, ease, and grace. Even if we understand intellectually or experientially the necessity of modifying or even letting go of our carefully crafted container, we can always learn more skillful and effective ways of going about it and going through it. And one of the things that interested me in this book uh, is, is the way that Richard Rohr tries to maintain this, this balance between religious and secular metaphors and references. Uh, some folks might find it a little bit too Christian, maybe, in terms of the language and the Bible references, but he always tries to offer a secular alternative. And he makes it very clear that even the Christian references aren't being used in traditional ways. Remember, alternative orthodoxy, right? Got some heresy here. Um, I, I was actually uh, listening to some of his lectures and podcasts, and at one point, he talks about how the paradox of falling upward and this idea of the two halves of life are at the very heart of the Christian understanding of the death and resurrection mystery played out in the life of Jesus. 
And then he said right after that, he said, this wasn't just Christian. This wasn't something that was exclusive to Jesus. Jesus was just pointing out a pattern of reality. He was pointing out how things work, how life unfolds. So there's some more of that alternative orthodoxy there for you. And there's something that's appealing to me about a book that a, that a Christian can read with a lot of gospel references that non-Christians can use as well. And here's the bonus, okay? The Christian references are actually, um, how shall I say it, rather subversive, okay? They're, they're offering this, this new understanding of the Gospels, and who knows, it may just seep in and start to change things for the better in sort of a behind-the-scenes and subversive way. It's much the way the Fillmores tried to do it when they started the Unity Movement. They were trying to offer some kind of an alternative to traditional concepts of Christianity that were equally subversive. So the introduction to the book starts out with an interesting observation. He says that our Western culture is losing the ability to understand myth and metaphor as providing valuable truth and insight into the human condition. Now, I would agree with him to the extent that there are indeed parts of our culture that might be losing that ability, although I don't think that that's happening in unity and groups like unity and like-minded uh, groups because... Um, well, for example, just a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about a book. You might remember The Big Picture by theoretical physicist Sean Carroll. And in The Big Picture, he talks about the need for developing a, a poetic, metaphorical, and even mythological way of talking about the natural world and this one reality, a different way to language it, poetic naturalism, he called it. So... I don't think it's a totally lost cause. Um, I think we're, we're, we're seeing it happen. We're regaining that ability. People are working on it, but we need to help it along by doing what we're doing. So, one of the myths that's used in Falling Upwards is the story of uh, is the, the Odyssey by Homer, the, the story of Odysseus written around 700 B.C., old, old story, almost as old as most of the stories in the Bible. And here's how, here's how Richard Rohr describes it. He says, The story of Odysseus is a classic transrational myth, one that many would say sets the bar and direction for all later Western storytelling. We all have our own little odysseys, but... The word came from the name of one man who fought, sailed, and lived a classic pattern of human, tragic, and heroic life many centuries ago. He calls it a transrational myth. Transrational. That's, that means that it's something greater than the rational mind or an exclusively rational approach to life um, is able to comprehend. It includes feeling and intuition. So it goes beyond rational to include these other things while still continuing to be rational. All of the things that we need to deal with that intangible side of reality that I like to call spirituality. And there's a reason why this story has been around for over 2,700 years. Um, just like George Lucas used ancient mythological archetypes in Star Wars, the Odyssey was the basis for a Coen Brothers movie from the year 2000. Anyone know what movie that was? Oh, brother, where art thou? There it is. This is, this is one of my all-time favorite movies. Um, and, and I will just tell you that, that the soundtrack is worth owning all by itself. Um, these old stories have ways of seeping into our culture over and over and over again. So, the Odyssey is the story of the king of Ithaca, who makes his way back home after the Trojan Wars. It's an epic adventure, and after enduring many challenges and hardships, he arrives home, only to find that he has to leave home once again, and undertake a brand new journey. He's required to 
journey beyond what he already knows. He's required to journey beyond the surroundings that were familiar and comfortable to him. He was always a sailor, and now he had to go to a place where people do not know of the sea. Then before he's able to return home again, he has to make certain sacrifices, right? And since this story is from 700 BC, um, these are animal sacrifices. There's a wild bull, a boar, and a ram. Uh, but it's also symbolism, obviously. These are metaphors for untrained, immature male energy, which he still had in abundance at that time. Those were the things that got him through that first half of life, but they wouldn't work during the second half of life. He had to sacrifice them, get rid of them, let them go. So it was only after the second part of the journey that he would be able to truly return home and then live out his remaining years in peace. It required a, a, a radical transformation. It started on his first voyage, and then uh, that transformation required a different container, a new, more mature vision of who he was and what he was to do at that point in his life. Now, this book does not offer any quick fixes or easy answers. Um, in one of the lectures that I was listening to, Richard Rohr, at the end of the lecture said, he said there would be a question and response session at the end of the talk. A question and response session, he called it, uh, because he didn't claim to have answers to anything. We usually call it a question and answer session. He doesn't claim to have answers, but he would respond to questions as best he could. I, li I like that kind of honesty and humility, and it's echoed in something that Carl Jung once said. He said that the greatest and most important problems of life are all fundamentally insoluble. They can never be solved, but only outgrown. Growth, especially spiritual growth, is a process. It's not a solution or a fix. And anyone who claims that they can teach you how to transform your life in five easy steps over the course of an eight-hour workshop spread out over two days on the weekend probably has a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you as well. So we're going to be spending the next six weeks exploring many ideas and probably solving nothing but certainly bringing what I hope is a little more light to a very important topic. So, next week we'll continue with the first half of life, then we'll move into the middle phase where things fall apart, and from there to that second half where there is sacrifice, discovery, and ultimately healing. See you next week. Bye.